Quilcher have a, a clearly stated ambition of, of building over a gigawatt of renewable energy projects over the next few years, which is going to have a, a significant contribution to the national renewable energy transition. Um, today, I'd like to, to talk to you a little bit about the importance of obtaining a social license. Um, I've broken this up into to three sections. What, what is a social, uh, a social license to operate? How is understanding this shifting our, our business model? And uh, in turn, how is that shifting the way we approach engagement? So what is a social license to operate? Um, Definition-wise, it's a local community's acceptance or approval of a company's presence and activities. So we as individuals give this to businesses all the time. Uh, if you live in the countryside, you'll know that the farmer next door on, on a few occasions during the year will spread particularly obnoxious substances on his fields. Uh, and if you put your clothes out to dry, they're likely to stink. Uh, if you leave the windows open, the house is going to smell pretty bad. You've probably been caught behind a herd of 50 cattle going down the road as a farmer moves his or her cattle from one field to another. Or maybe you live beside a farm who once a year has 45,000 people over for a long weekend of very loud music. Each of these businesses are given a social license by their neighbours to operate what do we mean by a social license? It's, it's granted by the local community, um, so not people from 150 miles away, neighbours. It has to be earned and then maintained, so our, our reputation and the way we behave is how we earn a social license and how we maintain it. Um, it's an expression of the quality of the relationship between a company and, a company and its neighbours. It's intangible informal and non-permanent. Engineers hate this because there's no figures. Um, you, can't, you can't quantify this relationship. It isn't written down on contracts or, or legal binding documents, and it can be removed at any point. It requires sustained investment by proponents to acquire and maintain a trustful relationship. Um, in the past, wind projects, other major infrastructure projects focused on the legal license to operate. So we, we, we uh, got everything to do with applying for a, a planning permit, a legal, a legal license. We had a tiny bit of consultation with local communities, very limited, you know, maybe a, uh, a leaflet, one public consultation just before we submitted planning permission. Then around you know, 2013, 2014, there was a major shift in that context in Ireland. And communities got themselves organized. They realized that they had the ability to block major infrastructure projects if they felt threatened by them. So that shifted the context into, a, into an arena where the social license to operate is now as important as the legal license. So how has this understanding shifted how we as a business look at this? Well, first of all, what are we trying to achieve? We want to build renewable projects that are financially successful, technically feasible, environmentally compatible, but fundamentally also socially supported. We want to build responsible projects that are good for Quilcher, good for local residents, and good for the country. When we look at our business model and our risk management, we're currently very good at managing the technical risks. We have engineers, we employ a, a large number of engineers, we have close relationships with turbine suppliers, there's huge numbers of um, research and development projects going on looking at managing the technical risks. We have um, we're very good at managing financial risks. The, the advisors that we have, the accountants, the relationships with banks and other financial institutions. For environmental risks, we employ environmental consultants who conduct huge surveys to manage the, the environmental risks. We, we have good communication with the large statutory bodies that are involved in environmental risk management. 
but we still haven't got our heads around managing social risk. Why, why should this matter to us? I think we're all very aware of the number of major projects across the country at this point that haven't come to fruition because of the lack of a social license and the ability for communities at this point to, to put a block on them. So managing all of our business risks is very important. We need to understand and adequately prioritize and resource the management of social risks to our business as well. Uh, risk is often mathematically calculated. So if you're an engineer or an insurance broker or a financier, you look at risk and you calculate it by saying magnitude, magnitude of the impact multiplied by the probability. So take a typhoon, for example. Um, the magnitude of the impact of a typhoon is very large, potentially very large. The probability of one hitting Wexford is probably very low, and, and therefore we examine the risk as, as being low. But what if you look at risk from a social perspective? Um, there was a chap called Peter Sandman, uh, who was a social scientist in the States in the 1980s, and he wanted to look at risk and understand how do individuals and communities calculate risk. So he coined this uh, equation, which looked at risk as a function of hazard plus outrage. So hazard, often you know, fact-based, we understand the hazards of fire or driving. Outrage is much more based on perception. So how do I feel about that particular hazard? Um, he outlined a number of triggers for outrage. Is it voluntary? Is the hazard voluntary or coerced? Is it natural or industrial? Is it familiar or unfamiliar? There are a number of them here. You can see the underpinning on all of them is actually fear. Am I and my family safe based on what you're doing? So take, for example, skiing. On the one hand, you decide to go on a ski trip. On the other hand, you're dragged out of bed in the middle of the night, hoiked up to the top of a mountain. Somebody straps two slippery poles to the bottom of your feet and pushes you down a mountain. The experience on the way down is pretty much the same. Nonetheless, one is recreation, the other is assault with a deadly weapon. Voluntary versus coerced. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about something uh, I'm very passionate about at the moment, DHMO. Um, Jeff has been a professional athlete for over 10 years. For seven years, he's been taking dihydrogen monoxide, DHMO, to increase his endurance. Jeff is now addicted. Without DHMO, he'll die in three days. There's a massive groundswell of anti against this. Let's have a look at what DHMO is. I mean, the dangers of DHMO, death by inhalation, it's corrosive, it's involved in brake failure, mass disaster and destruction. Where do we use DHMO? Animal research, uh, nuclear plants, chemical warfare. Where do we find it? It's everywhere. It's in cancerous tumors, in acid rain, industrial waste. It's even in our baby food and our beer. Dihydrogen monoxide, otherwise known as water. So I've communicated the risks of water to you in a way where you feel it's coerced, it's industrial, it's dreaded, and it's controlled by others. They're framing the discussion drives how people feel about a risk. And currently, the discussion is wholly framed by those who oppose wind energy. We need to communicate, or the way we communicate about risk directly links to the levels of outrage that people feel. Our engagement needs to listen, understand, and acknowledge the risks and the fears that people have, and then take far greater steps to address these risks. We live with water in our everyday lives because we understand the risks and we take clear steps to mitigate them. So what are we doing as Quilt Chanel uh, in our engagement approach? 
let's look back at the past. Let's be honest, it was fairly minimalist. Um, we only did what we were forced to do under regulation, national and EU regulations. One, maybe two public meetings just before submitting planning, letter drops if you're lucky, possibly a newsletter. So what did we do? We gave people limited information at the last moment. This is the way we looked at the stakeholders in our projects. We designed a project within our own silo. The community looked at our project from its silo. We did a little bit of communication where we had to. Same with the statutory stakeholders. Where we were regulated to, we discussed our project with them. What are we doing now? Well, we spent the last year working with Aston Eco to really kind of get under the skin of social risk management and stakeholder engagement. We're talking to people early. So right at the initial stage, concept stage of a project, before we started any of our surveys, and we start to build meaning for relationships. So again, not the 15 minute stand at the door, deliver a, a flyer, but three hours, four hours repeatedly over a number of months and build a conversation. We're checking that the scope of our surveys actually covers the issues that are important to people. And if they're not, we're amending those scopes. And we're ensuring that our communication is open, transparent, and clear. We're taking people that are willing to come with us through an engagement pathway. So we're starting by listening. Get out and really listen to people. What, what are they actually scared about or fearful of? We're reflecting back what we've heard, so we're informing people of what we've heard and checking that that's correct. Consultation, we are opening two-way dialogue, not just information provision. Involve, so where we can, we're encouraging people to be part of the design team. Collaborate, where we can work together, we can build stronger relationships and we can actually build mutually beneficial projects. And finally, a goal to adhere to or to aspire to is empowerment. How do we hand over decisions that belong to communities, to communities? Our um, project development team model looks at how do we make decisions with the right people in the room? So where decisions impact communities, they should be sitting at the table. Where our statutory stakeholders are involved, the closer they are to sitting at the table, the better the projects we can design. So my key takeaway message is really, one, the management of social risk is as important as the other risks we manage in our businesses. Two, decision ownership. People will only support a project they actually understand and feel that they've been involved in. And three, fair play. Our reputation as an industry and as individual country, uh, companies is based on how we behave as members of communities projects that significantly contribute to local development. And if our project has a negative impact on someone, then this needs to be acknowledged, mitigated as far as is possible, and ultimately compensated for appropriately if it can't be mitigated. Thanks. <laughs>